Ah, good old Daggerfall. Uh, so I started playing the Elder Scrolls series, or RPGs in general, with Oblivion whenever I was really young. I guess around middle school or high school. From there, I went on to play Morrowind because I was completely obsessed with the uh, the genre or the the series at that time. I was at the midnight release for Skyrim, um, and eventually I learned about Daggerfall, and uh, I learned how to emulate DOSBox on my Windows computer, and I started playing it, and it was just super confusing. It was very janky and. Although there was a tutorial in it, it didn't seem to explain itself very well, and I had trouble navigating the game. Uh, since then, Daggerfall has been ported to the Unity engine, it has been made much more stable, and it has a very active modding community. The, the last of these is perhaps the most compelling part of playing Daggerfall in 2024, um, and probably Eternity afterward, because it's just the game I play all the time. Um, anyway, if you're a new player who is perhaps played other Elder Scrolls titles and you're curious about Daggerfall or maybe you just are a fan of RPGs and don't want to check it out uh, I'd like this video to be sort of an introduction for you um, so there are already like a thousand videos about like um, how to play Daggerfall and how to get into it I find a lot of these are not to my taste as like a player uh, they often tell you how to make a quick or easy a very strong character so that you'll feel completely safe so the game won't challenge you and um, you know so you can experience the main quest and things like that um, I take this different approach where I really enjoy playing suboptimal characters and I really enjoy role-playing in Daggerfall because it's just a huge world and we're just a little guy roaming around doing our best to get through these huge enormous dungeons conquer dangerous enemies find rare artifacts um, and it just has a completely different feel to it than the later Elder Scrolls titles because of the scope of the world. Um, so I want to give a disclaimer that this video, while it is a new player guide, is not going to tell you how to make a very strong, overpowered character. I'm actually going to do quite the opposite, and I'm going to work on the assertion that this game is completely beatable and very enjoyable, even with um, suboptimal, weak-ish characters, because it's kind of designed to facilitate that kind of play in many ways. So throughout the course of this video, I'm going to walk you through the character creation process and show you what I like to do to make things a bit fun or interesting. Uh, I'll give you some tips about navigating this huge, enormous world, navigating the main quest, and um, I'll also talk about the mods that I recommend, some for that can apply to basically anybody playing the game and some that would be recommended just for um, people that want an extra challenge, things like that. First thing you, you'll see whenever you boot up Daggerfall Unity is going to be this window here. I'm going to walk you through some of the settings that I'd recommend that you might be interested for um, your purposes if you are a new player. Uh, first off, swap health and fatigue. The fatigue bar is red, the health bar is green in uh, vanilla Daggerfall. I'm used to this, but you might want to enable this, uh, since health is usually red in video games. Uh, let's see. Another quirk of Daggerfall is that um, attacking with your melee weapon requires holding down the right mouse button and then swinging it side to side, forward and back. It's kind of funky, and I'm used to it because I started playing with the uh, DOS version of Daggerfall, but you might want to either go to the click or hold sections to make it feel a bit more... Uh, I don't know, comfortable for you. Let's go look at the advanced options. So I'm over here in the gameplay tab on the left. Um, for a new player, I would recommend using this smaller dungeons feature. If, you, if you've seen my video about um, why I like Daggerfall's dungeons and why I don't use this feature, I've, I've played this game for a very long time, so I kind of know what to expect from these dungeons. And um, as a new player, you'll feel a little less intimidated with the smaller dungeons feature enabled. So. Do with that what you will. Uh, let's see. I enabled this uh, bow's draw and release option so that you hold down the right, right mouse button and then release it for to shoot. Um, toggling sneaks, also a good idea. Spell lighting and shadows, great. Keep those on. I disabled the crosshair personally because I want as little clutter on my HUD as possible. Also, my character does not have any crosshairs to work with. Um, so it almost feels like I'm cheating to have a crosshair there. Um, 
Let's see, vitals. Yeah, I keep my health bar on despite wanting reduced uh, clutter on my HUD because that would be uh, really difficult without that. Uh, let's see, this is a visual effect. I don't really care to talk about it. Oh, the arrow counter. By default, this is enabled. I have it disabled just because, I don't know, if... Like, I don't know why my character would know exactly that there are 24 arrows in his quiver or 76 arrows in his quiver. Um, so you might say, oh, the character would have a good, like, recollection of what's in his quiver. Well, so should the player, you know, just... This is up to your preference, but this is a cool option. I really like that you can enable it or disable it. Um, let's see. So... In your quest journal, this option will give you kind of a countdown for uh, deadlines, since you can fail quests by not completing them on time. I have a mod that does this, and so I don't really have that installed, uh, or enabled, rather. Uh, let's see. The dungeon wagon access prompt you should probably keep enabled for your first playthrough. Uh, let's see, you want to have mods installed or enabled in general. Uh, all this is fine. Oh, the lighting is a pretty important detail here. I keep mine pretty close to zero. I honestly thought it was on zero, but I guess point two um, serves pretty well. I'm actually going to bump up my night ambient light a bit, just because I wish there was some simulation of moonlight. Right now, night is completely dark. But yeah, I, I generally like as little ambient light as possible. I want light to come from light sources. Um, I also have player torch light turned all the way up, and item-based player torch turned up, or enabled. Uh, this way, I'm only going to be able to see if I have a light with me. Uh, it's pretty clear, but I can understand why you want to have, you know, some ambient light in what you're doing. Um, this near-death warning, I have it enabled. It's really just like flashing red, like you'd have... It's not like um, as egregious as Call of Duty or something like that, but it'll let you know to take a potion just by a visual effect. Um, I really highly recommend having advanced climbing system enabled. I'm pretty sure it's enabled by default. Enemy infighting is also a really good option to have enabled. This means that if basically there are teams of enemies in the games, let's say like um, animals and uh, rogues. So if an animal and a rogue come within uh, proximity to one another, they'll start, start fighting each other. It's really fun. You can kind of kite enemies towards each other if you're like, um, you know, feeling overwhelmed. However, people on the same team won't fight with each other. So if you lure a ghost toward a skeleton, they're just going to be vibing. They won't fight each other. Um, enhanced combat AI, AI. Not honestly sure what that does, but it can't hurt. Um, these other things, I'll kind of give you some time to look into yourself. I don't think they're super important. I would turn this maximum loiter time up to 12. Um, this is just depends on your... Uh, what you're running. Terrain distance might be important if you want to fast travel over the land a lot, and uh, some accessibility options. All right, without further ado, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so you're starting your first Daggerfall run through. That's awesome. Let's go to start new game. All right, so here's our first um, big important decision. If you've seen one of the new player guides where someone recommends this race or that race because of their awesome abilities, um, you probably know what to select here. I'm of the uh, school of thought that we shouldn't care so much about what those abilities are. We should just choose this uh, based on one of two things. Um, one, you should choose a, a race that you want to play because they are cool because you like the race and they have a cool aesthetic or they work with the lore that you want to implement. Like, uh, this game takes place in the provinces of High Rock and Hammerfell, so if you want to be a native of the region of the game, as some people do, you would want to be a Breton or a Redguard. The other option, which is usually my preference, is rolling an eight-sided die um, and just choosing which race I am. So it's what well, if it lands on a one, I come from Skyrim. Let's go clockwise from there. Two is a um, Dark Elf, Argonian, you know, um, such so on and so forth. You can't play um, Imperials unless there's a mod for that, or Orcs. Uh, I think there is a mod for that, but I don't have it. Go ahead and click Hammerfell for now. It'll give you some hint about what they are good at in this line of dialogue. Like, um, it describes these dark-skinned people as extremely hardy and quick. Legend has it that they are innately more proficient with weaponry than any other race. Um, so that's sort of a hint about what each race is good at. Again, I don't really pay attention to that stuff. Let's just get started. Choose uh, male or female based on your preference. Um, 
let's see. Let's choose from a list. Okay. This is um probably not going to be the class you stick with, but I actually kind of like these cute little questionnaires that older RPGs give you to determine your class. So I would do it just to see, you know, what what, what happens, you know? So it'll give you a sort of a prompt, and you can go through and select um, one option or another. And uh, let's see. Let's get through it. As you can see, I'm selecting some options that have created a mage outline in the firmament up here. Um, so each selection you make in the quiz will give you kind of a point toward a thief archetype or a warrior archetype or a mage archetype. And then the game will kind of assign you a class based on your selections here, uh, what all the points add up to. it. It's kind of like a BuzzFeed quiz or something like that. All right, so it pinned me down as a monk. It, if you want to go with this, that's fine. Um, I usually do this whenever I'm approaching an Elder Scrolls game or a new game that has this feature, just to give me sort of a baseline of what the game thinks I, as a person, might have fun playing. I'm going to go ahead and select No, um, and go down here to the Custom class, which is um, part of the fun of this game is choosing a custom class, but a caveat to that is that there is a lot of analysis paralysis whenever you're working with such a complex um, character creation system. There's absolutely nothing wrong with playing a pre-made class. They are suboptimal, but I'm all about the suboptimal stuff, man. Um, I had a lot of success with the uh, default acrobat character. It is, uh, I'm saying, this class is terrible. It barely has anything going for it. It's just a playstyle that I like a lot. A couple things to keep in mind if you do choose a pre-made class. The burglar uh, has a bug in its coding where um, it can only wear plate armor. This is likely meant to be plate armor is forbidden, and you can use leather armor, but um, yeah, that's Daggerfall for you. Uh, what else we got? The Sorcerer is basically a mage that has the Atronach birth sign. So if I understand correctly, or if my memory serves, you will not be able to regenerate Magicka automatically, and you will have spell absorption if you choose Sorcerer. But let's go to Custom Class and walk through what all this is all about. So... Going down the line of attributes here, strength determines your bonus damage whenever you hit someone. It also determines your carrying capacity. So someone with a lot of strength is going to be able to carry more loot and may not need a wagon quite as much as someone with low strength who will not be able to carry a loot and would benefit more from a wagon. Intelligence determines your spell points. Uh, at base, Your if you don't have any adv advantages, your intelligence, I'm sorry, your magicka will be equal to half your intelligence. It's not very great, but we have ways to improve that if you're a caster. Willpower helps you to um, resist magic attacks. Um, abstractly, I like willpower as, um, you know, how is this? how likely is a character to fold under pressure? Um, so it doesn't have to be used just for that mechanical purpose. It does have some sort of uh, narrative implications as well, in my opinion. Same for agility. Agility is kind of underwhelming in, um, excuse me, in its effects. It'll give you like plus one to hit on a 100-sided die roll, like on it, uh, whenever you're attacking per 10 level ups. All of these give you an increase in their um, effects every 10 levels. But the effects are just really, really unimpressive with agility. I still suggest leveling it up if you're playing like a thief character because um, it impacts things like dodging. Um, but it's really not that great. You should really choose agility based on like uh, narrative reasons more than anything, honestly. Endurance determines your hit points and things like that and how hardy you are in general. Um, so if you have 60 endurance, you'll gain one extra HP on level up. If you have 70 endurance, it'll be two extra HP on level up, and so on and so forth. I'm not sure if those are the exact numbers, but that's the general idea. The lower your endurance is, the fewer hit points you'll have. Personality is pretty important in this game, since it relies so much on diplomacy and social interaction. The higher your personality is, the more people are uh, going to like you, the more they're going to be okay with sharing information with you, uh, pointing out quests, and um, things like that. You should... Be cautious of making really low personality characters. Um, I'd say 30 to 50 is fine, but really keep it above 40 if you don't want to have a frustrating time talking to NPCs. Speed is super awesome. Keep your speed high. Like, I, I don't know how to play this game with a low speed. I've tried it before, but just as a player, I get much more enjoyment if my character can zip around it. It affects your movement speed and your attack speed. 
Um, and since this is a game that, while it's not turn-based, it still uses dice rolls, which is kind of archaic, but people like me like that, um, you're effectively increasing your accuracy when you increase your speed because you're, you, know, you have more attacks um, than you normally would. Luck uh, impacts everything in a small degree. You're rolling dice a lot, you're finding loot a lot. Luck is good to have, but you, know, you have other stuff to worry about typically. Uh, up here we can name our class. The one I'm going to show you first is what I'm going to call the Psionic. Let's talk about our primary skills, uh, major skills, and minor skills. Um, we have a ton of skills in this game, y'all. The three primary skills that you select are all going to help you level up. Um, every time you level up, let's say, uh, let me find my class sheet here. Um, this guy is going to use restoration. This, by the way, while he's like not a conventional character, this is the more user-friendly of the two classes I'm going to give you here. Uh, he's going to use Mysticism, and he's also going to use Hand-to-Hand. -hand. Uh, to give you some context, I'm basically creating a Psionic character, which is a certain type of caster in Dungeons & Dragons, although I was really inspired by the Adept archetype in the Shadowrun RPGs, where you'll, um, you'll use your Majory to uh, give your physical and sensory abilities enhancements. Um, so you can switch out Hand-to-Hand -hand with your preferred weapon type, like Longblade or Blunt, or something like that. I just really like hand-to-hand -hand in this game. Um, so we're going to use mysticism for things like um, mark and recall, uh, teleportation, and we're going to use restoration for buffs. Um, you know, we can in increase our strength to 100% or to 100 with a certain spell, and things like that. Uh, so like I was saying, all three of your primary skills help you to level up, regardless of which one is increased. Whereas with things like your major skill, uh, I'm using alteration... I'm using dodging, uh, let's do it like this, and I'm using uh, running. With your major skills, the two highest that level up will um, increase your character's char like level progression, but the lower one will not. Of course, if your lower one levels up like 10 times all of a sudden and overtakes the other two, that one will then start leveling up. It's it's kind of wonky. I advise you to not worry too much about the level up mechanics, but I, I have to tell you these things. Otherwise, uh, you'll be thoroughly confused whenever you start playing the game. Uh, so let me go ahead and fill out the rest of this. We're going to grab some Thaumaturgy because um, everybody needs to levitate. Um, I'm just kidding, but this guy needs to levitate. We're going to choose Jumping, because Acrobatics is awesome. We're going to choose Climbing, which is simply, besides maybe Hand-to-Hand, -hand, that's my favorite skill in the game. Um, critical Strike. One quick note about Critical Strike. By default, in the, the vanilla game, even in vanilla Daggerfall Unity, Critical Strike uh, will increase your chance to hit someone whenever you proc it, instead of giving you an increased amount of damage whenever you proc it. There's a mod for that that I'll be sure to talk about later. Um, we're going to also have archery, so we have some ranged options, and we're going to use medical. Even though we have restoration up here, I think it makes sense for this guy to have medical just because his body is so finely tuned. It's like he's um, engaging in active meditation every time he rests. So medical is going to help all three of our bars, uh, our health bar, our stamina bar, our magicka bar. It's going to help it all replenish more quickly whenever resting. All right, so to remind you, all three of your primary skills will help you to level up. Um, Two, your two higher major skills will advance your character's uh, level progression, and only one, your one highest minor skill, will increase your character's level progression. You should still use all the skills, but kind of keep that in mind. Like, if I, have, if I have climbing as a minor skill, that's usually the one that's helping me to level up. Um, so let's go ahead and go to our advantages. Um, ah, I'm getting ahead of myself. Look at this little skill, skill advancement for class thing. Um, this will basically determine how quickly your character will level up, how quickly your skills will increase to be specific, and the more advantages we have, the longer it will take for our skills to level up, and the more disadvantages we have, the more quickly we will level up. Same applies to our maximum hit points per level. Uh, to put things into context, the default class that has the highest max HP per level is the Barbarian, and I believe theirs is 12. So if you go higher than that, you should play with the mentality that you're playing a bulky, uh, like, uh, fighter character. And it's okay to go below that if you're playing, like, a kind of shrimpy character. Uh, anyway, let's talk about the advantages. 
each monster has um, a sort of sound that it emits whenever you're near it. Acute hearing helps you to hear those sounds from further away. It's honestly not that important, but uh, if you want it for roleplay reasons, like if you're playing a scout or a ranger, go for it. Adrenaline Rush gives you uh, combat bonuses whenever you're very low on health. Athleticism makes you better at jumping, climbing, and running. Uh, bonus Hit gives you extra options for animals, Daedra, Humanoid, or Undead. This makes you more likely to hit whichever you select. You can also click your selection to delete it. Expertise in will let you have um, a few extra skill points in whatever you choose. Um, for this guy, I think we're doing Expertise in hand-to-hand. -hand. I think I'm also choosing Adrenaline... Uh, Athleticism, I mean. Okay, let's talk about immunity for a second. This immunity lets you be completely immune to some of the dangerous threats in the game, like paralysis is the one you hear about a lot, or, or disease. The game does become significantly less frustrating if you use paralysis or immunity to paralysis or immunity to, to disease, but to play the devil's advocate a little bit, I would suggest abstaining from complete immunity maybe grab some resistance which is another option but um being completely immune to paralysis is convenient but it doesn't benefit the player very much because i think it's beneficial whenever you're playing a game like this to know which creatures to fear so by not being immune to paralysis you'll come to understand which creatures can paralyze you you'll know which ones to fear because of that and you'll learn that it's good to have a few potions of free action on you. Um, so, like, let's look at how much this immunity to paralysis cost me. My dagger that makes things uh, harder to advance just jumped up quite a bit whenever I selected that. If I reduce it, it goes back down significantly. Um, so, honestly, I'd say just, like, for immunity to disease and paralysis, they're good to have. But I think that you would benefit more from not having those things so that you as the player can learn what to be wary of and your character i mean why what's the narrative reason for them to be magically immune to this i don't know maybe there is an actual magical reason anyway that's my ted talk on immunity um let's go to increased majory like i mentioned before your default spell points are half of your intelligence so with my intelligence currently like 25 i mean at 50 i would only have 25 um spell points if you're playing a caster or somebody that's going to rely on spell points a lot, you'll want to select this advantage that gives you three times intelligence and spell points. There are some more like um, middling options like double intelligence and spell points or just intelligence and spell points. But if you're going to rely on spells a lot, just go for it. It's going to drive your dagger up a lot, but honestly it's very helpful. Uh, you can also choose rapid healing in general in darkness or in light. I like these a lot, that uh, you have the option to select in darkness or light, because if you're a sinister character who really likes to lurk in the shadows, um, then this might be helpful for you. You're often in dungeons, so it's a practical one to have. Um, and being in light, it, it would make sense for someone who is less sinister, if you're a priest, uh, or if you just camp outside a lot. Uh, anyway, we're going to not use either of those. Uh, I think Rapid Healing applies to whenever you're resting, which is different from Regenerate Health, which um, gives you a little bit of health constantly. It's a very, very small amount. With my character Wades and Reeds, I, he was an Argonian, so I really memed out and shows uh, while immersed in water. I can confirm that that is the most useless advantage. I wouldn't even call it an advantage. It gives you like 1 HP every 60 seconds, and only if you're completely submerged in water. Uh, which is hard to do if you're using the mods that I do because, you know, you'll your stamina will start depleting if you're using ca uh, climates and calories and you're fully wet. Uh, but yeah, it's it's good to have. Regenerate health, pretty straightforward. Resistance is like immunity, but you'll take... Um, actually, I'm not sure if you take reduced damage. I, I think you actually have a higher chance to resist the spell effect altogether. Uh, spell absorption is what you probably know about from the other Elder Scrolls games. You can just... Uh, oh, this is a cool one where you can have it apply in darkness, light, or in general also. Selecting general rather than specifying dark or light will... Uh, it takes uh, it drives the dagger up higher is what I'm trying to say. Um, let's go ahead and look at our disadvantages here. We can have a critical weakness to these same things that we can choose immunities for. The optimal choice here is to choose frost. Again, I don't want to like tell you explicitly to do optimal things, but if you just want to know how to get that dagger down a bit further... 
Frost is probably the element that is used least in the game, and so uh, there's that. To give you a big warning on a similar note, many casters use shock spells. Um, so just be on the lookout for like a critical weakness to shock is super frustrating. That's like hard mode. Um, an interesting thing about this character creation is that it really does feel like it's a, a difficulty setting. And you're driving the difficulty up a lot by selecting critical weakness and shock. Um, you can also select to take damage from holy places or sunlight, which I think is really cool if you're playing um, an evil character or someone that's really into danger worship, that sort of thing. Uh, they're cool options to have. So Darkness Powered Majory is perhaps for other sinister um, diabolical characters that will give you lower magic ability in daylight or make you completely unable to use magic in daylight. Um, lower magic ability, if I remember correctly, means that you'll have reduced uh, maximum magicka and even once you get to the dark spot, again, you might have to rest to bring that back up. Uh, you can choose to have forbidden armor types. Like I was mentioning earlier, the burglar has this bug where it can only wear plate. And although the idea was that the burglar shouldn't wear plate ever because he's trying to be sneaky. Um, so that's just another way that you can express your character's like um, class and his personality through these things. Um, another example is someone who's... Uh, you can have forbidden materials, right? And if you're someone who is very... Um, suspicious of the Daedra, you wouldn't want to wear Daedric armor ever, even though it's the best in the game. And so you could choose a forbidden material of Daedric. Um, if you don't plan on using shields, you have a, all these forbidden shield types to take. I believe there's a an artifact in the game that uses one of these shield types, but I don't remember which one it is, so I don't want to give you any false information there. Forbidden weaponry works the same way. Um, for all you melee characters out there, you might want to choose this inability to regen spell points. It drives the dagger down a lot, makes things a lot easier for you. Um, you'll have to regenerate your spell points if you choose to have any by either spell absorption effects or um, uh, drinking potions of restore power. Despite their name, the power that's being restored to you is like spell points. Um, so if you're playing a melee character, you can also select darkness powered majory, unable to use magic in daylight. Uh, Light-powered magery, unable to use uh, magic in darkness. And then look through this dagger. It's all the way down here. It gives you so many points to work with. That's like a good and a bad thing, in my opinion, just because like sometimes I feel a little bit like I'm abusing the system some by choosing all, all those things, just because I was never planning to use spells anyway, you know? But anyway, I digress. If you want to play a melee character, do those three things. You'll have a lot of points to work with. Uh, you can have low tolerance, which is like kind of like resistance, like you'll be worse at resisting these things without being critically weak. Again, be wary of selecting shock for this, because uh, many people will just destroy you. You can have a phobia of any of our four categories here, animals, daedra, humanoid, and undead. Um, this means that you'll be worse at hitting them. If it has other implications, I'm not sure. I like to choose at least one phobia per character, just because it makes sense that something will kind of get your character's goat. Um, so I'm going to choose for this guy animals, um, and I'm going to choose, I think I had some forbidden weaponry also. So let's go ahead and give this guy forbidden armor types, plate, um, he's going to have forbidden weaponry, long swords, he's going to have, uh, basically all the forbidden shields, he's hand to hand, why does he need shields? Alright, forbidden shield types. You can only have so many disadvantages, so you can't exactly stock up on all of them, but, uh, oh, didn't mean to do that. But you can grab a lot. Alright, I'm also going to drive the max hit points per level down a bit, um, just to make him a bit more frail. The last piece of the puzzle for now is going to be editing our reputations. Um, this is going to impact how people in the world react to you. People in the, uh, let's start from left to right. You click up here, merchants will have a more favorable disposition to you, and they'll be more likely to give you information and help you out, things like that. And uh, you can drive that into the negative as well. Peasants are mostly common folks that you'll see in the city streets. Scholars, I understand as people as in the Mages Guild, I'm not sure if it applies to anybody else, maybe the Temple of Julianos. Nobility are people that you'll find in palaces. Um, they require good etiquette to talk to them, and they'll be more willing to help you out if this is up high. Uh, Lastly, we have Underworld. This is people like 
uh, the Dark Brotherhood, Thieves Guild, um, and probably the Necromancers as well. So I'm not going to think too hard about this guy's um, options since I'm probably not going to play with him. I think Scholars will like him. Um, people in the Underworld will not like him because he's... I don't want to be so generic as to call him a good guy, but he's going to be a good guy. Um, nobility is not going to be fond of him because he's a friend of the common folk. And uh, let's say merchants dislike him too because he's going to be kind of a, a, ascetic. Like A-S-C ascetic. Um, like he doesn't really rely much on purchased goods. All right. Uh, these reputations are a very... They seem like a small detail, but I think that they're really cool. Um in fleshing out your character and giving it some um, intuition about who you want to get your quests from and things like that. Uh, by the way, I forgot to rearrange our stats here, so let me go ahead and give my dude high intelligence and high speed. Um, that's mostly what he's concerned with. I don't even mind driving his um, strength a little bit low. His willpower should be high. Um, and his personality. I mentioned that we shouldn't bring that down too far, but... That's okay. Okay, so let's go forward here. You can uh, fast start by automatically selecting your character's background. I would suggest the longer start of answering these questions. Um, these will ask you things like, after the School of Restoration, which magic have you been studying the longest? This is, um, like many things here, this is going to give you a, um, a bonus to your skills. So let's just go with mysticism. What motivates you? This guy wants like um, internal perfection, but we're going to go with helping others. Uh, in between formal study, you spend your time doing what? Um, sometimes it's hard to tell what uh, skill you get from something, but choose what sounds right. This guy practices acrobatics. Um, since childhood, you have saved... Uh, let's give him a book. Okay, so this is a, something I really want to talk about. In gratitude for services rendered, the Emperor gives you... Uh, all right. Let's skip all the other options and talk about the Ebony Dagger. The Ebony Dagger is like one of the best short swords that you can get in the game, at least as far as non-enchanted things goes. It's right behind the Daedric in quality. So besides being able to hit every enemy type, which, you know, a, an Iron Dagger wouldn't be able to cut a ghost or something like that. Besides being able to hit every enemy type, you could sell this Ebony Dagger for quite a large sum of money to start off your game. Um, if you're new to the game, picking the ebony dagger and selling it or using it it's kind of like a rite of passage so i suggest going for it uh this is another moment where character creation feels like a difficulty slider though so i'm going to turn the difficulty slider up by just grabbing a book and based on what you choose you might also have some reputation changes let's name ourselves by clicking the random button repeatedly and we can choose a face okay then we roll some dice. You can re-roll, you can save your roll. I, since I like, um, I'm a 3d6 down the line kind of guy whenever I play Dungeons and Dragons. Um, so I don't usually re-roll, but you have a button right there that'll let you do that. This kind of gives you some more insight about what your modifiers are going to be. Um, like right now my two hit is at neutral, my strength is at minus one. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and pump the speed and uh, maybe some more endurance would be nice. Bring it up to plus one healing rate and plus one hit points. There we go. Uh, finally, we can put some more skills, uh, skill points in here. Let's make our um, hand to hand a bit higher so that we will more reliably hit enemies. We're going to pump up our alteration to make skills, uh, spells of that class a little uh, easier to cast. It will require less spell points, and uh, because climbing is badass, I'm going to bump it up also. Uh, by the way, this last part really helps you determine like which skill is going to be the one that levels you up a lot. There's probably a more efficient way to manage your level ups than that, but I, I really don't want to get caught in the weeds of talking about that. Reflexes determine how fast the enemies move. Choose very high. It's, that's We're playing a video game in the 21st century, like... A really old video game uh so we we're kind of more twitchy than they used to be i guess is what i'm trying to say okay and here's the other class i wanted to show you this one is objectively le worse from a survivability standpoint i call him i'm calling him the merchant uh so his primary skills are mercantile etiquette and streetwise these are language skills which means you um in the case of etiquette and streetwise 
you have dialogue options and you'll be more successful whenever using the polite dialogue option with etiquette and more successful when using the blunt uh, dialogue option with streetwise but in addition um, they are language skills which means that you can go around uh, pacifying enemies you have a chance to pacify enemies um, that are of a certain type like etiquette i believe works on characters like knights and archers whereas streetwise can help you to pacify uh, things like thieves or night blades so if you run into a dungeon and you end up pacifying an enemy like this uh, they won't attack you and because of enemy infighting you can then lure other enemies toward them to uh, kind of make a team like that uh, there's also a mod called the Language Skill Overhaul that lets you uh, make these pacified enemies into followers. Uh, I haven't used that one much, but I look forward to trying it soon. Alright, next we have major skills like uh, Short Blade, Backstabbing, and Stealth. This guy is not going to join the Thieves Guild or the Dark Brotherhood or anything like that, uh, but because he is so terrible in combat, you know, 35 strength, uh, 40 endurance, 45 agility, he's really not that good. Uh, he's kind of a coward, and so he needs stealth and backstabbing because he's such a coward. Uh, I also have dodging so that he won't get hit quite as often, um, lockpicking so that he can get to treasure, orcish so that he can team up with orcs, and the other mobility skills, except for swimming, um, climbing, running, and jumping. So another note about those language skills, you have things like orcish, daedric, um, giantish, harpy, impish. These all let you pacify that kind of enemy. Um, the Daggerfall enemy expansion adds more creatures that can be pacified. Like there's one called a grotesque that can also be pacified by giantish. Um, I believe the archaeologist guild mod might do this also with things like the gargoyle. Like gargoyle enemy types can be pacified by giantish, I believe. Um, but yeah, it doesn't really matter what we select here. Let's move on to the special advantages. I gave this guy bonus to hit uh, for humanoids because I think that's who he interacts with all the time. He knows how to read their actions a bit better. He has an expertise in short blade because he's um, kind of a scumbag. He's likely to like um, stab you in the back. And uh, he has resistance to poison for the same reason that... Um, the Dread Pirate Roberts has like immunity to Iocane Powder in uh, uh, the Princess Bride. It's like he's kind of wary that his enemies might want to poison him, so he has built up an immunity. Uh, as far as special disadvantages, he's terrified of Daedra and Undead. He's really out of his element whenever he's um, encountering these creatures. He also can't regenerate spell points. I'm going to leave him with spell points just because I don't want the, the dagger to be too far down make uh, things a little too easy uh, as far as his attributes are concerned I left high intelligence even though he's not really going to be much of a spellcaster because he's very shrewd in his business deals um, he has low willpower because he's easily bribed and easily persuaded and manipulated because of his greed um, he has high personality because of reasons you know he's persuasive he's a merchant um, He's also, I have high luck because I imagine this guy would also be a gambler if that were an option. High speed because he's good at running away. Um, so you can see that this character, it's not very well optimized. It doesn't really seem like it would make sense, but I promise you, you can still beat the game with a character like this, especially if you use things like the Archaeologist Guild mod, which um, it makes your language skills much more powerful or the language skill overhaul. And honestly, you don't need very high skills to succeed in the game. You just need to use skills, and then your skills will grow. Um, it's always recommended for new players, though, to have at least one weapon skill up here, which is why my psionic character had hand-to-hand uh, -hand up here. But, you know, do whatever feels right. Pick a theme for your character, and uh, let the character sheet guide you and like determine what this playthrough is going to be like. Um, you should also check out Adventure Art's um, channel where he has a video about um, character creation in Daggerfall. I don't personally feel like I did it much justice, partially because he has a video like that already, but in case you don't want to go watch two videos, um, that here here are a couple of characters that, uh, that you can use sort of as an idea of what a decent character looks like versus a janky but fun character. And boy, do we love these janky but fun characters. So next, I want to give you some basics about playing the game itself. 
You're going to start the game in a dungeon called Privateer's Hold. I believe that Privateer's Hold is a bit sacred, and, uh, yeah. It's a bit sacred. It's a rite of passage for new players, so I don't want to show you Privateer's Hold. Just go out there and figure it out, man. It's like a really, really well-made tutorial dungeon, in my opinion. It introduces you to a variety of enemy types, including um, a couple of enemies that you won't be able to damage with um, your starting weapon. Uh, unless you have magic or maybe some uh, uh, the ebony dagger or something like that. Um, anyway, without further ado, I started in a random dungeon because I like that mod. Um, in case you're curious, let's go just show off the key bindings I have. I'm not going to go over these. Pause the video and take a look at it if you want to copy me some. Uh, one thing I want to point out is that the sheath and unsheath weapon for me is V rather than F, like you might see in the other Elder Scrolls games. That's because I use a mod called Basic Roads that I highly recommend, and Basic Roads says, no, I want the F key, and we can't really do much about that, so um, just throwing that out there. Okay. Uh, besides that, uh, there's a lot of different movement types. You can run uh, like this, or you can sprint. Uh, you can go into stealth mode. I have that on control. I also have that on toggle. Um, so you, stealth mode doesn't necessarily mean crouching, but there is a crouch button if you want to get down low. I'm not sure if this does anything besides let you fit through small spaces, which honestly, um, does not come up that often. Uh, if you're a spellcaster, it might feel a bit weird for you, but, um, did I get sent to Privateer's Hold? This, this is weird. This looks exactly like Privateer's Hold, but it isn't. What are the odds of that? I started in a cell block that was almost identical to Privateer's Hold, but I'm not in Privateer's Hold. After doing the random dungeon thing, that's, that's wacky. Oh, okay. All right, all right. Um, I'm going to stay focused. More mobility things to talk about. Let's jump down here. You can go into climbing mode. I mentioned this is one of my favorite skills. Just try to walk as straight as possible toward the wall, and then voila, you're up there. Uh, part of the advanced climbing feature um, introduced with Daggerfall Unity is you can approach the edge here and walk backwards to uh, descend the wall. You go into repel mode rather than just falling down. Um, it's kind of hard to do, so I put uh, myself in stealth mode to go slowly and then back up. This does it like 100% of the times. So you can't misclick it, basically, if you're doing it this way. Um... What else can I talk about with mo movement and things like that? Uh, you know, let me save my test character for this next part. And we're going to load uh, good old Wades and Reeds. Uh, sorry, I want to talk about swimming and levitation because they have a kind of weird system. So let me take a potion of levitation real quick. If you've played Morrowind, you normally levitate by looking around like this, and I guess you can do it like that also, like looking up while moving forward will take you up. Looking down while moving forward will do that. But you also have the raise and lower buttons so that you can kind of maneuver as usual and look around as usual. Um, just with the touch of a button. I have those set to like these um, little buttons on the side of my mouse. Do what's comfortable for you. These levitation mechanics apply for swimming as well. Uh, if you end up swimming underwater, this little moat won't give you a very good example, but if you end up swimming underwater, you're going to move really, really slowly unless you have taken a potion of water walking. Uh, water walking is not like an oblivion where you're just like Jesus for a while and skim across a lake. Water walking in this game gives you movement speed in water that is equal to your regular movement speed. If you're submerged in water, you need to use the rise and lower button, as far as I'm aware, to go up and down. Um... Anyway, I just didn't have a... Oh, man, what was my character's name? Uh, shit, I might have lost that. Is it this one? Yeah, this is my test character. Let's load this bad boy up. Uh, yeah, besides that, let's go find an enemy to fight. There's a spider up here. Oh, I've got the spider's attention. I don't want to fight a spider. Um, I should just go over the controls while we're up here. So I'm using the mouse wiggle system, um, so you don't have to do it like that, but something to point out, they have different uh, hit chances and damage output based on which attack you're using. So the most reliable option is the thrust. You hold the mouse button down and then move it forward to do this thrust attack. 
that will give you the highest hit chance and the lowest damage output and an overhead chop will give you the lowest hit chance and highest damage output so um something to keep in mind there and then everything else diagonal horizontal slashes and stuff it's just kind of in the middle i don't have that memorized i don't pay much attention to the other options um so you probably oh i have to unlock this one by the way, I switched from my weapon to my other hand by pressing the H key, or whatever you bound that to. It's helpful in times like this, whenever you have to kick down doors, to switch to your regular fist. Um, just because you don't, like, if I were to do this, I'm bringing down the durability of my weapon. Uh, so, something to keep in mind. I'd really, really like to fight some rats and some of the spider- Oh shit, alright, that's a bunch of bats. Um, so this works on dice roll systems. The higher your um, your weapon skill is, the more likely you're going to be to hit. Um, let's see. Let's go over spell casting as well. This character has some spells, so you have to press the spell casting book to bring up the menu here. Uh, let's go with um, Arcane Arrow. So it says press button to fire spell, but it doesn't tell you which one. It's whatever your activation button is, which is, for most of us, I'm guessing, spacebar. Alright, so I cast the spell. I'm not going to press the recast button, so it gets ready without me going to my spell book. I'm going to cast it again. I keep missing, and that's okay. Um, another thing to point out is that 3 brings up your magic item menu. If you see me going with my other characters to a bunch of potions, that's because I opened the magic item menu. So yeah, hopefully... Um, remember to go to your spell book and then recast using a, the quick key button, but be careful whenever you're recasting. You know, you don't want to forget what is on your recast and then get yourself, like, you know, teleported out of the dungeon or something like that. Okay, um, I wanted to point out just how effective the bob and weave, bob and weave strategy is in this game. The higher your uh, speed is, the more likely you're going to be, oh man, I keep forgetting about climates and calories. I normally don't use it with this character. I didn't back in the day. Let's see if I can throw this on and maybe the Khajiit suit to help out. All right. So he's going to try to whack at me. And once his animation starts up, I'm going to back up and then go in. Still got hit. Um, but you can kind of bait out their attacks and then swoop in for an attack. Uh, doing this strategy, it's pretty straightforward if you've played other Elder Scrolls games. It's not that different. It's just uh, pixelated. <laughs> Uh, but it will help your survival a lot. Uh, you also have... Let's see what else we can talk about here. So if we're... Uh, oh, I have two bows. I didn't know that. Let's, that still illustrates my point. Basically, if we're equipping a weapon, notice that it takes a super long time for the weapon to show up. It's kind of like your adventurer is reaching through their bag. The Daedric bow still hasn't shown up yet. It still hasn't shown up yet. It still hasn't shown up yet. All right, here it is. Um, there's a mod that disables this. But I kind of like keeping the uh, that delay on. It makes sense to me that it would take a while to reach through your bag or um, unsheath your other weapon. Uh, but it also incentivizes dual wielding weapons. Um, and if you're able to switch seamlessly from one weapon to the next, then being able to equip two weapons at once. Um, they're not on the screen at the same time like they are in Skyrim, but you can switch between them using the switch hand button um, really quickly. And so... Keeping this option enabled where it takes a while to switch weapons, it um, it gives you a reason to play dual-handed every now and then. Um, so that's one thing to point out. Another thing is that if you attack someone from behind, you will proc the backstabbing skill, or you have a chance to do extra damage due to your backstabbing skill. Uh, besides that, I mean, there's critical striking. You probably know what that is, though, by now, so I'm not going to talk about it. Okay. Uh, now that you have your character, you can pull up your inventory using one button or your character sheet using the other button. It's kind of helpful to go to your character sheet every now and then. Let's say you take a break and you don't really remember a lot about your character. You can find things like um, your history. This button down here will show you uh, all the advantages and disadvantages you have. A little, I think, slightly overlooked feature in Daggerfall that I think is cute is it kind of generates a background for you. Um, it actually has a pre-written background for each of the pre-built classes, and whatever 
your custom class seems to resemble the most out of the pre-built classes you'll have um, you'll have that classes like background because everybody's background canonically involves befriending the emperor for this game's purpose so it has a way of looping that in um, so that's neat let's talk about other things in your character sheet you can get to your spell book uh, you can get to your quest log from here or your inventory uh, you can see your primary skills, your major skills, and your minor skills. Your hand-to-hand -hand damage will be shown here also, if you have hand-to-hand. -hand. Um, all your miscellaneous skills are the things that you haven't touched, really. Um, perhaps the most important thing here is your affiliations. This shows all of your factions and your reputation with the factions. So, um... Your reputation with each faction that you join will start, I believe, at 1. As you complete quests, you will advance in rank. I believe it's in increments of 10, so I've probably advanced about 3 ranks in the Temple of Kinnereth, uh, 4 ranks in the Fighter's Guild, and uh, just 1 rank in the Order of the Candle. Um, so that's kind of... Uh, a lot of factions are in this game, guys. Like uh, You have the Fighter's Guild... You have the Mages Guild, Thieves Guild, the Dark Brotherhoods. Uh, those are the ones you'd kind of expect from an Elder Scrolls game. The Order of the Candle is one of the many knightly orders that you can join. And uh, a knightly order is specific to a region. Uh, you can guess that it's kind of like the Fighters Guild, but uh, there's an air, uh, like an air of nobility about it or uh, honor to it. And it comes with different advantages and... Um, and services than the Fighters Guild. Uh, you can only choose one knightly order to be a part of. Since I'm in the Order of the Candle, I cannot be in the Order of the Dragon in Daggerfall. Um, another set of factions that you can only join one of is a temple. So, Wades and Reeds is in the Temple of Kinnereth. I think I joined them because they provide um, every rank increase you have in the Temple of Kinnereth increases your ability to hold your breath underwater and like swimming is a uh, primary skill for this guy even though it's practically useless uh so i thought it'd be cute to uh yeah have longer uh, better breath uh holding skills anyway you'll have the uh the temples of the eight divines each one has their own uh faction that you can join you can only join one of them and yeah, I, I spoke correctly whenever I said eight divines. This is at a point in Elder Scrolls lore before Talos became a god. Um, so you can choose a temple to join. I, I recommend almost every character join a temple. Like You might not even be that religious. Uh, but there are practical reasons to be part of a temple in Elder Scrolls. Just like how in real life there are... This is going to make me sound like a sociopath, but... There are practical reasons to be part of a church or a temple in real life too you know um not everyone who goes to church is um participates in that religion they just want the like the social benefits of being there right and in a similar fashion you might be um wanting to join a certain temple so that you can access their potion maker or their potion vendor or they train in a certain skill that you really want to have training in so whenever deciding which factions to join, a lot of it will come naturally, like for the Thieves Guild, if you're playing a thief, uh, you go around and you get caught thieving, and then you will eventually be contacted to join the Thieves Guild. Uh, or if you want to join the Dark Brotherhood, you go around murdering innocent people, and similarly, you will be reached out to eventually to join the Dark Brotherhood. Um, the other... The other ones, like, uh, besides those main four that we've seen in other games, the Temples and the Knightly Orders, I guess the Temples in particular, I, I just want to point out that there are two ways to go about, uh, like, deciding which ones to join. I tend to prefer just choosing based on, like, an aesthetic choice, uh, or you can choose if there's, like, a really compelling service. Like I mentioned before, Wades and Reeds, joined the Temple of Kinnereth just because I thought it'd be funny if he could breathe, like, hold his breath longer. Um, but if you have a, a an in-game reason to join a certain temple, for example, um, a scholarly character might join the School of Julianos. Um, it's almost like a mage's guild, but it's religious. Uh, you know, that kind of makes the decision for you. Or uh, previously, 
I showed you that character called the Merchant, and uh, he would definitely join the um, uh, the Cult of Zen or the Temple of Zen or Zenithar, the God of Commerce. Like I don't even know what services they offer, but it's like I have to do that. You know, it just it seems like the story writes itself at that point. Um, I should also point out that reputation grows with each quest that you complete. So right now I'm at like 36 in the uh, Kinnereth Guild. And if I complete a quest, I think that'll bump up to like 41. But I'm not going to get the promotion instantaneously if I've been promoted recently. You have to wait about a month between um, promotions in a faction to receive another promotion. So if you've been grinding a lot and your reputation is skyrocketing and you're like, dude, why aren't they promoting me? They just want some time to pass. Um, so you don't go from novice to master like in a week, basically. So... Um, you gain about five. I, that's the ballpark just based on memory. I didn't look it up or anything. You gain about five for completing a quest. And if you fail a quest, you will lose one reputation. Um, that means that if you're really low on reputation, you risk expulsion. So be very careful and selective with those early levels of reputation whenever you're accepting quests. You don't want to take on something that you end up failing and get expelled for. Um... Something else to keep in mind is that these guilds have conflicts with one another. So if the Temple of Kinnereth were to ever send me to um, maybe fight someone from the Fighters Guild, I don't think a quest like that actually exists, but just hear me out. Hypothetically, if Kinnereth's temple wanted me to go get an artifact that people from the Fighters Guild also wanted, and um, I brought the artifact to the Temple of Kinnereth instead of the Fighters Guild, I might lose reputation with the Fighters Guild instead of Kinnereth. So there are times whenever you have to choose where your loyalties lie in that sense. If I remember correctly, your reputation can decay with factions if you don't do quests for them every now and then. I believe it's at a rate of one reputation loss per month. So every month that I don't do a quest for Kinnereth, my reputation will decrease, decrease slightly. So um, for your first playthrough or uh, early playthroughs, I really recommend just one or two factions, like um, the Mage's Guild and a Temple, Fighter's Guild and a Temple, something like that. Um, otherwise, you'll find yourself spread kind of thin while trying to grind for three or four guilds and the main quest. All right, so I'm going to assume that you have escaped Privateer's Hold. Uh, it'll look like winter for you probably, but I came here during the springtime, so... I believe the tutorial tells you this, but it's a good idea to go to Daggerfall City in Daggerfall. So this might be your first glimpse of the world map. Um, the red region is the region that you're in. You can click on that and see a bunch of... Uh, let's enable all of these. A bunch of different places on the map. Uh, these little lines are part of the Basic Roads mod, by the way. If you don't have that installed so you're not seeing them, don't freak. Um, so you can use the IMAP button to indicate where you are. Most of the time, you'll be using this find option to search for, let's say, Daggerfall. Alright, uh, so here are some options for us. Often, you'll be traveling cautiously if you want to arrive to a city during the daytime, because if you arrive there at nighttime by traveling recklessly, um, the gates may be closed. The city gates close at night, so... Um, if you want to get there in time to shop and visit temples and things like that, you might want to travel cautiously. Uh, but take a look at the travel time. Right now, whenever I'm traveling cautiously, it's four days. But if I travel recklessly while um, the city might be closed, uh, the gates might be closed whenever I get there, I'll get there like twice as fast, essentially. Another consideration when deciding to choose cautiously or recklessly, um, you will arrive with full magic uh, stamina and health if you travel cautiously. Uh, but you won't get those back if you travel recklessly. It's like you're traveling so aggressively that you don't fully rest. Um, usually you'll be trans uh, going by foot or horse, but you can also use a ship. I have a mod installed that makes it to where you can only travel by ship if you're at a port. Um, and, you know, to show you what that's like, I'm going to disable all of these. Uh, it looks like, oh, oh I have to just uh, enable towns. The only locations in the Daggerfall province that fit the category of town and port is going to be Daggerfall itself and this place down there. So I won't be traveling by ship usually. Uh, let's turn all these on again. 
Um, so, I honestly, I can't remember what the difference is between um, stopping at inns or camping out in the default game. I think it's just cheaper to camp out, uh, typically. But if you have the um, travel options mod installed, um, camping out will let you travel across the map. You can either do this at 10% speed, or I'm sorry, uh, wait, a group of rats have interrupted the travel. Uh, that's okay, we run past them. Um, I don't really want to talk too much about travel options right now. It's pretty neat. You can get it up to 30. Oh, what? Wow, I thought the max was 30, but I guess I installed a mod, like an update that brings it up to 60. What the hell? Uh, okay, that's awesome. <laughs> cool. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and just fast travel to Daggerfall the old-fashioned way, because it would still take a while even at 60 times speed to get there. Um, by the way, notice that it said that my axe skill had improved. It takes six hours between your, uh, reaching the threshold for a skill leveling up and the skill to actual level up, uh, actually level up. So you usually have to rest or, um, travel for the skill to increase. Alright, so we just got to Daggerfall. What I want to point out first is, um, the little hand next to the, yeah, sorry. Sorry, guy, Magician's gonna have to go away. The little hand in the bottom left corner of my screen next to my fatigue and um, health bars. This indicates what mode we're working in. Whoa, hello. Alright, so depending on what your key bindings are, you can switch between these with F1 through F4. That's where mine are. Uh, this one is in steel mode, so that means that... Let me put on my hood so climbing and calories will uh, chill out a bit. Steel mode will let you pickpocket people. Like I'll just quick, I don't want to quick save because, oh, let me check out what my actual save is. Okay. For demonstration purposes only, we're going to try to pickpocket this lady. Um, and now guards are coming after me. If you're in a dungeon or roaming around at night, steel mode is also how you'll uh, break through doors and lockpick. If you fail at lockpicking, then um, you can bash the door down by using your weapon. I feel like this shouldn't be here. <laughs> Let's reload to a time whenever I wasn't a criminal. Uh, okay, so that's steel mode. Grab mode is like steel mode, but you're just grabbing things. It's very self-explanatory, and this is a good default to keep on because if you leave steel mode on, I swear there's going to be a time in your, like, it's another rite of passage in Daggerfall. You misclick and you try to steal from someone. You might be tempted to re to be like to reload at that point, but you might just like get arrested anyway. Like I said, we misclick all the time in real life, so it's worth seeing how it plays out. Maybe this person accused you of something that you didn't do. That happens quite frequently in real life. Anyway, grab mode. It does what you think it does. Info mode lets you go around and um, interact with people. Like this is this person. It gives you their name. Um, this indifferent thing is from a mod I have installed. It also tells you the name of buildings, like this is the Black Wolf Tavern, and if I go to my map, it shows here. Uh, your map won't be as filled in as this, but the city map is color-coded. So the green ones are all taverns, the blue ones are guilds, uh, and all the orange ones are shops. If you need to find a certain place, uh, let's see, you go to the dialogue menu. So uh, one thing to keep in mind... Uh, let me back up a little bit. Uh, that was info mode. I'm pressing um, speech mode over here, or dialogue mode. You can tell by the icon down there. Anyway. Ah, uh, dude. She's totally giving me the cold shoulder. Let's go to this juggler over here. He seems alright. Oh, he's angry. This is an angry juggler. Okay. Whenever you're talking with the common folk, people that are not nobility, they really prefer if you use this blunt tone. So if I go to just, like, uh, tell me about any news... And I do it in a polite way. It's my character will say, "Salutations, friend. You haven't heard anything interesting lately, have you?" Um, <laughs> Van Town got over his Atronog problem. Great. Um, since I have nothing nice to say, he's not going to say anything at all. He'll generally be more receptive if you use the blunt tone. It's kind of hard to demonstrate here since I'm not actively pursuing a quest. Let's see if we can get a quest, actually. Okay, I'm gonna ask about work 
uh, with this guy using the blunt tone. Why in Tamriel would I offer a Khajiit like you a job? Of course, that's fucking racist in this town. Okay, what about you, kid? Do you know about work? Where can I get some work? Um, Andister Gerhouse asked me to look for people like you. Find him at the Feather and Goat. Uh, one thing to point out about navigation is if I ask someone in here about where the Feather and Goat is, uh, let's go to where is location, uh, taverns. You can tell by the title of the Feather and Goat, it's going to be a tavern. Uh, let's see. I don't think it's organized alphabetically right now, which is a little weird. Here it is at the bottom. Uh, so I'm indoors right now, and this guy's just going to tell me to go east instead of having the option to put it on my map. Uh, I would really like to have the feather and goat marked on my map, so I'm going to go outdoors and talk to this jester again. Um, he should be able to put it on my map. Um, so, okay, actually he might just be mean. Okay, yeah, he's just going to be mean to me. Let me find somebody who will help me out. Okay, let's go to taverns. Feather and goat. Alright, so he's still telling me to go east, but if I just click this enough, you'll get an option saying that he put it on your map. Go here and look and find the feather and goat, which should be to the east. I'm going to use my sugar clumps to bring my horse back to me. Sugar clumps. There we go. Sugar lumps. Okay, so... I'm trying not to sprint. You have the option to sprint with your horse, but with the roleplay and realism mod installed, you can trample down villagers, and the guards will come after you usually, and you'll like have worse reputation. Every time I do this, I tell myself it's the last time I'm going to do it. But then whenever I'm traveling across the city, I just, I just want to get out there, man. And they'll come up out of nowhere because they're two-dimensional figures, and so like. They're practically a pixel one second, and then they rotate, and it's a boom. It's like a whole person was there that you didn't see. Okay, we're almost there. We're going to get here, and we're going to ask for Adistair, or whatever his name was. Or we'll go around clicking on NPCs until somebody gives us a quest. Oh, dude, there he is. In the Savage Fairy Hostel, my darling Heroian Mastercroft awaits me, tormented by the tyranny of the cruel... Isausa Kinging. I cannot sleep while uh, my love is so imprisoned, but I fear the agents of Isausa Kinging who work to keep us apart. Will you go with me to the Savage Fairy Hostel and protect me? Hell yeah, dude. Let's go. All right. My gratitude is endless. Quickly, let us uh, away to get Perorian. We can find him at the Master House residence in the Savage Fairy Hostel. So... This is generally how quests are going to be given out. You don't always have to chase them down because you can join factions that will give you quests more easily. Um, but your quest target will usually be laid out for you like this. It's very easy to end up at the wrong place because the names are generated um, like procedurally and kind of randomly. So there's a lot of samey stuff out there. But we're looking for the residence, which means we're not going to search for it on the world map. And we are, we are looking for the Savage Fairy Hostel, which is probably in the world map. So let's go out here. Let's mount my horse, because I have realistic wagon installed, which means my horse will get left behind. Um, ah, dude. My bad. I already forgot which one it is. Uh, you can go back to your quest log and click on the quest, uh, click on the quest to find out where you need to go again. Um, Savage Fairy Hostel. Yeah, I'm the worst about that. Savage Fairy Hostel. Okay, so we're at the right place. Now we have to figure out which residence um, he mentioned. Oh, okay. That was super lucky. It won't be as lucky for you, but if you go into info mode, you can, like, click around. I I've honestly never had a first try like that. Um, assuming that you're not lucky like that, let's figure out how we would get this marked on our map otherwise. Um, so let's talk to Bedniak here. I'm going to say, where is location? And go to the general tab. And basically any location that you've heard of from a quest will be found here. And you'll hammer OK until he, um, oh, this guy doesn't want to give me the light of the day. But uh, you get the idea, right? Go to general again. Eventually, he'll tell you directions or put it on your map, and you'll go in there and complete your quest. 
Um, navigating this little gameplay loop of knowing where to go for your quests can be tricky at first, but remember to use the correct type of uh, tone, either blunt for the common folk or polite for nobility and palaces and such. Um, remember to ask around using location people, since we've heard of Karorian. They can also point out the, um, the residents this way. Uh, so if you know someone's name, you can get to the place using the people tab, or you can go to location general, and uh, if you know the name of the, uh, the building, you'll find it this way. So I hope that helps you stay a bit more grounded and goal-oriented um, when looking around and completing quests. I would be remiss if we didn't talk about the criminal justice system in Daggerfall, at least for a little bit. Um, so let's take a look at the world map. Your reputation in each province or in each area is tracked separately. So in the Alessan Hills, I'm considered a criminal because I did a bit of breaking and entering here whenever this guy needed some more money. Um, so I'm not sure if the guards, I guess they don't hate me enough to start attacking me instantly. Uh, but often they uh, they'll kind of pop out and try to arrest me. The fact that I'm a criminal means I'm pretty close to a certain couple of thresholds that will uh, make it almost impossible for me to exist in this region. Oh, look. Okay, here they come. Oh, speak of the devil. I'm under arrest for criminal conspiracy. Um, so we have some options here. Uh, first off, notice I didn't commit any crimes just now. I've just committed crimes here like a year ago. They remember my ass. Um, so they're going to take me in on some bullshit charge, criminal conspiracy, because they can't pin down the actual thing. Uh, they don't have any evidence. How could they? All right. So they asked me if um, I want to bribe the guard. I'm going to um, decline just for the sake of letting you see what happens next. Do you wish to surrender to the city guard? Normally this character would just say no and run away. That's fine. But let's go ahead and submit to them so you can see what happens after this. You, Zakir Selhan, are accused of the crime of criminal conspiracy. If you plead not guilty and are found guilty, you will face banishment. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Okay, a uh, guilty plea will invoke the mercy of the court and your penalty will be far less. How plea you? All right, so um, you can just take the punishment, um, but you can also select not guilty and you can use your intelligence to try to debate and prove that you are innocent here, or you can use your personality to lie to them and, uh, you know, get away with it. Uh, let's try to lie. Uh, oh, they find me guilty. I'm going to be... Banished from Gala Tower, never to return. All right, this has actually never happened to me before. That is awesome. Uh, okay, yeah. So if you go around burgling, I recommend, like, if you're using travel options, it's really fun to stay near the border of an area and then steal a bunch of stuff and then ride westward in the next town and uh, sell all your stuff at the next town. And if you hang out near the border, you can hit up a lot of places like that. It's, it's so much fun being a burglar in this game. All right, so I was about to go cruise on over to a dungeon to kind of give you some tips about exploration, but you don't want to go to a dungeon unprepared, so I'm going to just show you a few things that I want to consider before going to my dungeon. Uh, let's look at our carry weight. I'm pretty close to capacity. It's not that bad right now, but you can see I have a thousand gold pieces on me. That weighs three kilograms. Usually you'll have more than that and it'll be a glaring issue, but just to show you what to do in this situation, Yes, your gold weighs something, and this makes banks relevant. So if you go to a city, it'll often have a bank. I'm going to go into this banking option. I'm going to throw down a 1,000 gold. And then if you want some gold to carry with you that you can use, you can withdraw a letter of credit. It looks like I have like 6,000 pieces in my inventory. I can't do 6,202, the exact amount, because they'll tell me that they... Um, they need me to withdraw an amount that they can pay for, but like they're going to take a 1% fee. So, you know, that's how banks are, you know what I mean? Total ripoff. But we'll just get a yeah letter of credit for 6100 That way I have all the gold I need, but um, uh, it doesn't weigh as much. This is why I have so many letters of credit here. I really need to consolidate all this. Um, before you go into your next dangerous dungeon, I recommend bringing some spell effects that will increase your chances of survival. Some of these are optional and some of them are lose conditions, like game over conditions. At least if you, um, you're a new player, you're not going to 
you know, delete your character whenever you die, right? But these are good things to have. Um, you can have these through your spellbook, or more commonly for me, since I don't play casters usually, is just having some uh, potions. But let's talk about these important ones, like healing and heal true. This is partial healing. This whole heals your whole thing. It's awesome. Um, you really want some potions of cure poison and cure disease because you might run into like the plague or something like that while you're out in the wild. And if you're in a dungeon and you contract a disease and you cannot cure it, oh man, you're gonna have a really hard time getting home. If you try to fast travel, you might just die. So it's always good to have at least one potion of cure disease with you. Or if you have the um, recall spell or a potion of teleport, uh, you can, let's set an anchor here. Let's drink a potion of teleport and then I'll come over here and use it again. You get the idea. It's like you set an anchor and then you can teleport back to it. So I like to have a potion of teleport set near a temple for this exact reason in case there's just something dire that I need handled. Um, so potions of teleport are also good to have if you don't have access to this spell. I believe those are added in the roleplay and realism mod. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Cure poison is also really good to have. A lot of enemies, like um, particularly the rogue types and um, things that are buddies with the rogues, like assassins, they'll poison you. And I believe, I don't know if there's a variety of poisons, they might just deplete your stamina. And like I mentioned before, if your fatigue runs completely out in a dungeon, you're just dead. Same for the wilderness, you'll just get eaten by monsters or uh, animals or something like that. Uh, you absolutely need a potion of free action wherever you're going also. Um, this is what's going to keep, get you uh, moving again if you get paralyzed. One thing to point out is that free action does not cure your paralysis. It treats the symptom of paralysis. And sometimes the duration of the paralysis is longer than the duration of free action. On the one hand, that's cool because this means that like, if you take a potion of free action, you just start moving and moving and you want to kill as many people that can paralyze you as possible. On the other hand, like, you might still be paralyzed after your free action effect runs out. So that's, do with that what you will. I also like keeping a potion of slow falling and levitate with me. Um, because sometimes like you'll misclick or run into a pitfall trap and this will keep you from dying from fall damage. Water breathing and water walking are also good to have. Um, let's see. Everything else is kind of optional. I want to talk about invisibility for a second, though. So if you were to go to like the main quest, eventually you'll be asked by one of the major powers of the Iliac Bay, either Daggerfall, Sentinel, or Wayrest, to go infiltrate a rival castle. Or, like in Daggerfall, you get some quests from people in the castle that are in restricted areas. So you'll go to those restricted areas, and then the whole palace is after you, it seems like. But from a narrative perspective, you're still in, like, a hero helping them out? Like, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, right? So in addition to using uh, potions of invisibility to get past danger in dungeons... I like to use a potion of invisibility in instances where I need to enter like the dungeon beneath Wayrest Palace. Um, just because like I have a reputation to uphold there. I don't want them seeing me. It of course looks a bit wacky that the door is opening and closing by itself, but at least I can't pin it on me necessarily. Um, little factoid about that. If you read the Daggerfall manual, you'll see that there is mentioned a, uh, a disguise skill. So it seemed like the developers imagined that you would be able to put on a disguise and thus this weird plot hole wouldn't be in the game. For whatever reason, that got cut and I just used potions of invisibility. I really wish there was a, um, a way to use disguises like that. It doesn't have to be a separate skill. Like I, I could see it being a skill check that falls under stealth and personality or something like that. But I don't make mods, I play video games. Um, so I can't really complain about it that much. Anyway, those are the essentials that I would bring with me. Oh, I didn't mention Potion of Stamina. Bring Potions of Stamina so that, um, if you get hit by, if you just run out of stamina, you want to, like, not die. Drink some stamina potions. Bring some with you. Um, 
Another thing to point out on this note is that not every potion vendor will have what you need. Oh, this guy has free action and invisibility. That's kind of cool. But if I were looking for healing potions, this would be kind of annoying. Um, I like potion quest a lot, but it can get kind of tiresome for your non-magic characters to go around to each town looking for like alchemists. This is why I have this like so many potions. It's like I just go shopping a lot. Um, by the way, this is an optional one, but resist shock is good because of so how many casters cast you know shock spells at you. Just good to have, you know. All right. Um, believe that's all I wanted to talk about. Um, another thing to prepare though is just make sure your armor is up to date. Make sure it's all repaired. This ebony battle axe is worn, but once it breaks, I'm just switching to this ebony archer's axe. It's all good. Um, once you feel that you're prepared, you should go to your dungeon. Often this will be provided to you by a quest, but I just found a map called, um, uh, what is this place called? Let me look at my notes. I keep a little legal pad with me, by the way, where I jot some stuff down. Um, you can use the in-game notebook also. For example, I always make sure to write down where my anchor is because for teleportation purposes, it doesn't always, um, tell you about that. The game will add some automatically, like it told me that I added, uh, that I found Castle Coppersley. Uh, but you can also click on this notebook up here and be like, um, recruit some uh, rogues, not rouges, but rogues to um, hold down a dungeon, which is something that this character wants to do. I just don't have the right mod installed yet for it. So in this way, you can kind of keep track of your little emergent narrative side quests. Um, get vengeance on that son of a bitch. Um, that sort of thing. Yeah, let's delete that. So the notebook is pretty handy. You can only add one line of text, though. So I use like a, a maybe a word editor sometimes, often just a legal pad. Uh, but yeah, let's go ahead and go to Castle Coppersley so that I can kind of show you um, just kind of some basics about navigating dungeons. Let's get this show on the road. Yeah, I have a mod installed that adds um, soldiers to keep. Sometimes they'll attack you, sometimes they'll let you go through. Uh, I'm going to turn this music down some because I don't I don't love this track, I'm going to be honest. It shows up a bit too often. I like the kind of creepy dungeon ambiance. Just turned on a lantern so I can see a bit better. Okay, this guy's gonna have a chance to paralyze me, but he should be okay. Alright, so normally you come in here for a quest target. This is just a random quest, so I'm not necessarily looking for a quest target. But uh, general principles when exploring a dungeon is... You've probably done this in many games before, but you want to keep to one side like i'm keeping i'm just turning left basically the whole time right now oh it looks like i need to break this door down i'm gonna unequip my um Adric short sword so i don't break it by uh kicking the door down oh that is terrifying uh and this is my iron man character shit shit um we're going to drink a potion of orc strength and do our best. Okay, I'm silenced. That's not dangerous for me. Come on, come on. Let's drink a potion of healing. I don't remember how dangerous the day drops are. Oh, great. Nice and creepy. Light went out. Okay. Alright, killed our first day drop with this character. That's nice and scary. Uh, I have climates and calories installed, which means I can only rest at my campfire or at a place like this that's like an in-game fire, so I'm going to go ahead and rest up after that fight. I'm also going to mark this as a fire. Okay. I'm uh, going to see if I can open up this drafty door. Okay, it's kind of loud. Um, so, like I mentioned before, one common way of exploring is just keeping something on your left side. Um or your right hand side, whatever your preference is. I'm going to refuel my lantern and turn it back on. Um, but since adapting to climates and calories where I can only rest at certain like fires like this, I've been prone to like what I'm calling the spoke and wheel method of 
um, exploration, which means I'm going to use this healing spot as kind of like a hub. And I'm going to explore from here and see what I find. Uh, that looks like a teleporter. I don't want to jump into a teleporter yet. Um, so I might go this way and explore westward for a while. And then if I get low on health, I'll backtrack and sleep right here. And then I'll go explore eastward for a while. Oh, it's going to hit me with some nukes real quick. And after I've explored east for some time, I'm going to go back and rest in this little hub area. And this is just like the difference between keeping something on your left side. You'll always come back to it, of course. And um, this spoken wheel sort of uh, method of exploration. In addition to coming back to this hub area, like it's a bonfire in Dark Souls, I also like the spoke and wheel... Um, is that what I'm trying to... I feel like I'm not saying that right. Um, wheel and spoke. I don't know. Another reason why I like this method, though, is that you really ingrain the pattern of this dungeon in your memory. So you have to refer to your map a little bit less. Um, so if you're exploring a dungeon, keep in mind that you're exploring a dungeon block at a time. This whole thing is one dungeon block. There's a lot of the block that I have not explored yet. And um, the main difference between smaller dungeons and the default dungeons is the amount of blocks in it. I think um, with smaller dungeons, you have one dungeon block, one cohesive area like this. Um, and then it connects to one block on the other side, um, north, east, south, west, and then one above and one below or something like that. It's, it's much smaller. Um, but once you get the feel for certain dungeon blocks, you start to sort of memorize some patterns in them. You'll recognize a hallway where you're like, oh... That was a secret passage before, and so you'll go through and uh, you'll go into grab mode and click on a torch, and then it will like slide over and reveal a secret passage. Um, there's probably a lot of stuff that I'm leaving out here in this dungeon exploration bit, but I'm hoping that a couple of these ideas will help you. Oh, hello! Help you to find your quest items and to feel not so lost in these dungeons. It it's procedurally generated, so everything does look quite samey. Um, but you can still navigate these dungeons if you, you know, wire your brain to think a certain way. I mentioned this in a previous video, but these little markers are also very helpful for not getting lost. So let's say I came to this intersection, and I wanted to remember that the entrance is to the north. I'll just come in, I'll double click, and I'll write um, N entrance, or something like that. Or let's do exit so I can type correctly. This way you're leading sort of a, leaving a breadcrumb trail for you to get out by. Um, let's see. I think that's all I wanted to talk about besides using potions of seeking and things like this to navigate to your quest target. Um, potions of seeking come with the Penwick Papers mod. I don't really like that mod a whole lot, but I have everything but the potion of seeking disabled, so I still use that mod technically. Um, I don't have a quest target here, so I can't really illustrate how it works, but you'll take a Potion of Seeking and you'll get a directive up at the top of your screen that will tell you um, that the quest target is like, let's say, Potion of Seeking, North, Higher, I'll just like copy down what the Potion of Seeking tells me. And so if I start exploring North and then Higher, it might give me another blurb that says uh, West, and so I'll say POS west there are also locator devices that you get from the archaeologist guild that they help you find the quest target but in a different manner it'll show like a glowing gold orb somewhere in the vicinity of that quest target and only if you're close to it so these are just some things to keep in mind again a lot of this you're just going to have to learn on your own but i hope these tips will kind of help you navigate these dungeons okay so after playing the game um, after a few in-game months, or maybe a few in-game weeks, you're going to get this letter from Lady Magnesson. This is where the main quest starts. I'm not going to read this now, but I'll point out that you have to meet her, uh, meet up with her at this place called... Um, well, it's not a static set-in-stone thing, but she'll give you a place to travel to. So I'm traveling to the Whitewood Borough of Daggerfall, and I'm looking for the dead woodchuck. 
there's a time limit on this. Um, so let me go to the Whitewood Burrow. You're supposed to meet her within 30 days. Let's see if I can get there. Yeah, I can get there by traveling. I already go upstairs. Oh, here she is. Okay, so, um, let's see. I'm gonna skip over what she says, but I want to point out this last part. Um, she wants you to investigate those who might have wronged King Lysandus of Daggerfall to figure out why he has this legion of undead ghosts tormenting the city. Um, she says, I do not know if the royal family of Daggerfall or another person or persons merit more suspicion. The major powers of the bay, the uh, Sentinel, Wayrest, and Daggerfall may be good places to start. Um, if you want to complete the main quest without having to use a guide, let this part get burned into your brain. Like, go check out Sentinel, Wayrest, and Daggerfall. Um, I think she says something about... Um, let's see. Yeah, she gives you a little bit of information about um, what what is going on with this letter that's missing and how it ties into the uh, death of King Lysandis. But you really just want to go investigate the, um, the nobility in particular in Daggerfall, Wayrest, and Sentinel. And uh, the, I've heard a common critique of Daggerfall is it doesn't give you very much direction, but I honestly think that's plenty of direction. You want to go to Daggerfall, Daggerfall here, and... Um, Go talk to people there. Go into the palace and start talking to people. I swear I did that um, with my bandit character that I'm, uh, it's like my Iron Man character right now. And I got like four or five quests uh, done from the main quest just by going to Daggerfall City and talking to people in the palace. And once you're you're doing this, you're going to end up getting letters to go to Wayrest for the main quest and Sentinel for the main quest. Uh, I would suggest avoiding the uh, guides as much as possible. You are, of course, in charge of this decision, and there's no shame in using a guide. Uh, I just think it's kind of fun to play games blind as best as I can. Okay, let's talk about some of the mods that I recommend using with this game. I'm going to start off by talking about things that um, improve certain gameplay aspects. There are a lot of other mods that add really great aesthetic um, things to the game, like more elements in the wilderness, um, more things that you can run into, more textures, all sorts of great stuff that makes the world feel more alive than the vanilla game. Um, but I want to first talk about the essential mods that will positively impact the gameplay experience. Uh, let's start off by talking about travel options. That's the one where it lets it allows um, overland travel, like um, on your horse or on your feet, and allows you to go up to like 30 or 60 times regular speed. Basic roads works really well with this um, because you add a bunch of roads in between cities and settlements, and then you can just like tap F on the path to fast forward with travel options. It's really cool. Um, I love what this has done to the game. You know, whenever you're traveling to a location that's nearby, um, over the world like that, you often run into cool things, or it just looks beautiful. It's, it's awesome. Okay, um, roleplay and realism is a long list of things, um, that make the game feel a bit more immersive. For example, if you're carrying a lot of stuff, your speed stat will be temporarily reduced. Um, this kind of makes you think twice about stacking up all the way close to your maximum inventory. Um, and it has a bunch of other really cool role-playing features that I can't remember off the top of my head. This is the mod that will get you to, uh, will allow you to sprint on a horse, but, you know, you could trample down a villager if you do that, so, um... The Roleplay Realism Items mod adds a bunch of cool assets in terms of items to the game. Don't have an exhaustive list for you, but a lot of cool new armors are available because of this. It's like, um, there wasn't a lot of medium armor options in Daggerfall initially, and this adds a lot of cool variety. 
Five minutes in calories, I would recommend only to a certain type of gamer that is okay with having survival elements placed on them. You'll have to keep track of the temperature um, around you. For example, if you come out of Privateer's Hold and it's snowing out there, you'll want to wear a couple of formal cloaks um, instead of wearing nothing or even just the casual cloaks because they are thicker and provide more warmth. Um, maybe wear the fur armor from roleplay and realism items to warm up a bit, that sort of thing. But if you're traveling around Sentinel in the desert where it's really hot, you want to wear practically nothing. Um, and you don't want to wear armor because it might burn you, things like that. Um, in addition to that, one physical thing to keep track of, you also have to keep track of your water, which doesn't often come up except if you're traveling in a um, the desert. Keep track of food, either by carrying rations with you um, or by eating. One thing I really like about Climates and Calories is that it adds a lot of cool like menu options at the ends whenever you're getting food or um, alcohol or drinks. It adds a bunch of cool menu options that are that change with the region. Like it's a lot of detail that went into um, crafting this list of uh, like menu items, and I I really appreciate that. Um, this also makes it to where you can only rest in a bed, like, let's say like in dungeons, your resting options are really limited. Um, you can technically rest without a bed, but you'll have a lot of debuffs applied to you for it. You want to rest at a campfire that you bring with you, either in the wilderness or into the dungeon. Um, and it kind of changes the way you explore the dungeon because you can only rest reliably at one of these fires. This is the one that creates an implicit checkpoint system that I talked about in my um, video about Daggerfall's dungeons. Okay, moving on down. Bethany Restored is a cool one. I guess it falls under the aesthetics category in a way, but it affects your gameplay. Basically, the Isle of Bethany off the coast of Daggerfall was in Daggerfall's demos, uh, but it's just completely empty is my understanding, or very empty, um, besides a couple of dungeons maybe. Uh, so, Cliff Worms, who's something a legend in these corners of the internet, um, basically recreated the Isle of Bethany to match the what the lore implies the Isle would look like, and what the uh, what we saw in the demo of Daggerfall. He also created detailed city walls. That's a an aesthetic mod that makes city walls look good. Shoot, we're right here. So let's talk about um, Taverns Redone, which creates a lot of variety um, in taverns and makes them look more cohesive. Um, and uh, make a bit more sense from a, oh, this is where people eat, you know, this is where people perform sort of thing. It just looks much better. If you use the Dream mod, which is um, a graphics overhaul, you'll want to have this patch for it. Okay, back to gameplay stuff. Archaeologist Guild, it's just a must-have. It adds a guild that focuses on language skills, and it revamps the way that languages work. Birds in Daggerfall adds birds in the air. It's cool. Um, I'm going to come back to this one. Famous Faces of the Iliac Bay adds a lot of portraits for major characters <clears throat> who are not in the first in the uh, default game, vanilla game. So, really good one to check out. Um, Bloodfall is not super essential, but it's cute. It adds um, blood spatters onto the floors of dungeons, and you can like tell where a fight has occurred, um, which helps you get back to the entrance sometimes if you're not sure where you came from, um, and it tells you where other enemies have been. Convenient quest log is the mod I use that helps me manage my quest log. It's recommended, but, you know, not necessary. I recommend the critical hits for just about everybody. Critical hits mod for everybody. Um, this is the fix that changes the uh, critical strike skill from applying a two hit bonus into a, like, uh, damage bonus. So critical hits makes sense to me as someone who, like, came from a tabletop RPG background. Uh, let's see come back to those uh, dungeon loot recommended for just about anybody it adds let me back up you'll be exploring a dungeon and you'll find this like texture that looks like um, a rack of weapons or a bookshelf or a rack of potions like what you'd find at a shop in the town but if you click on it you don't get to see it it's just like a really needless set, um, set dressing so dungeon loot lets you interact with those things to get new loot. It's really cool and it makes sense to have it. Um, 
locked loot containers. If you were paying attention while I was playing this time, um, I watched, walked past a lot of green boxes while I was in dungeons. These like green chests are added by locked loot containers. Um, and it basically gives you more rewarding loot and more things to do as a thief um, or with your lockpicking skill while you're in a dungeon. In addition to lock, uh, using your lockpicking skill to get into these, you can bash them, but um, you'll actually end up bashing some of the loot inside also um, if you have to go that route. It's pretty interesting. Meter Monsters is great for anyone who wants a challenge. Persistent dungeons, uh, dungeons is completely recommended, like 100%, because initially in Daggerfall, you'd go into a dungeon, you'd fight for a while. If you left and came back, all of the enemies would be back, and I think even your auto map would be redone, so you wouldn't be able to see where you left from. Persistent dungeons allows these dungeons to not reset immediately, and you can have um, up to 360. Uh, you can have these dungeons persist for up to about a year in game. I do about 30 days, but you can do what you want with that. You'll refresh every time you go back to a dungeon. I like this because I don't want the pressure of like clearing the dungeon the moment I go into it. It is kind of cool in a video gamey sense to have that challenge lurking, but from a realistic perspective, I like to be able to leave, go back to town and restock and like come back and have things as I as they were. Um because all the people getting revived, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. Um this is you're able to this corpse decay time option is your ability to control how long corpses in the, in the dungeon stay there and um, you also have an option to increase the maximum number of dungeons that your game can remember just keep in mind that there are um, more storage requirements the longer your game has to remember a dungeon um, and there are additional storage requirements for the number of dungeons that your game has to remember um, you can yeah, it's uh, just keep that in mind. You know, do with that what you will. I don't know your rig. Mine's not great, so I um, keep it kind of small. Uh, finding my religions, another great thing from Cliffworms that adds a bunch of um, new aesthetics to the temples that you go to, um, the factions. So you might recognize um, if you played Oblivion the mod "Losing My Religion," which was also like a revamp of the system of uh, or of the chapels in Oblivion to make it feel more like the faction system here in Daggerfall. Same author made this mod in Daggerfall. Full circle. Really cool. Order service is a cool one where you can ask a armorer or a weaponsmith in town to make something for you. I think you can ask clothes makers to do that too. So if you're missing, missing one certain piece of uh, armor, you can order it. It's pretty neat. Fixed dungeon architecture is another one by Cliffworms. I don't exactly know what it does. But I trust this guy, so I have it installed. I use random starting dungeon um, because I've played this game for years. I'm kind of tired of the uh, privateer's hold grind. I do not recommend this for <clears throat> new players. Please enjoy privateer's hold while it's still fresh and new to you. Such a cool dungeon. Realistic wagon is a great mod, but it's going to whether you want to use it is up to you. It really comes down to play style. Um, <clears throat> in vanilla Daggerfall, you buy a horse. You do this in a general store, that's true in Daggerfall Unity. And then the horse just gives you an option in this little travel menu. You press the T key by default, I think it's that one. And you can choose to uh, ride your horse. Then the horse appears beneath you. And um, that's also how you dismount it, and it just makes you faster. It's not, you can't see your horse unless you're on it. It's not like a thing in the world. So Realistic Wagon changes that, and... Um, it makes it such that you get to keep up with your horse and you can dismount it and watch it. Like it's, it has an actual 2D sprite. You can go up and mount it again. And it just makes a bit more sense to me to have that kind of system than the original because like, let's say I'm a burglar in vanilla Daggerfall. I go into a shop at night, I break into it. I take all I can hold and I run away and I get on my horse, right? I start running out of town, but the city gates are closed because it's nighttime. So I dismount the horse by putting it in my pocket. And then I levitate or climb over the walls. I jump down. I take the horse out of my pocket like it's a Pokemon or some shit and ride off into the night. Um, the fact that you just put stuff like horses and wagons in your pockets in the original concept, like you have to abstract using your imagination pretty heavily. And it doesn't have the satisfying implications of the realistic wagon mod. It's called Realistic Wagon because your wagon works the same way also. 
Um, it won't just be a thing that you click on your uh, menu to access more storage. You'll leave it in like, uh, places, you'll drag it around. Um, so it really comes down to play style because you'll have to get new horses and new wagons every now and then, or at least horses, because like, I've had an, um, a situation occur where I've had to teleport back to town with my horse still at the dungeon, and I'm not about to walk back to the dungeon, so I buy a new horse. It, you know, it just adds... It's up to you if you want to deal with all that, because I really enjoy that, but, you know, it might not be something that you want to try out at first. Um, fixed Dungeon Exteriors, another great one by Cliffworms. Um, basically, the randomized dungeons in original Daggerfall often had very minimal entrances, and so you'd go on a quest to, um, like, Castle Fjellham, and you're like, oh great, it's gonna be this castle, like, oh, I see in this background, it's gonna be badass, and you get there, and it's a mound in the, like, on the ground, with a door on it. Um, it doesn't make much sense, so Cliffworms made a mod where you'll have an exterior to the dungeon that maps, uh, matches the name of the dungeon. So a cave will have that sort of, um, mound on the ground with a door, um, exterior, but a castle would have a castle. Um, Lively Cities adds more content to the cities. You should install it. Um, let's see. Rest warning if unwell is absolutely pretty cool to have. This will give you a warning if you're diseased before you go to sleep. Instead of like, you go to sleep with a disease and that disease kills you in your sleep and you're like, oh, well, I the game hasn't even told me I have a disease yet. Um, and you just die. So this will give you a warning, just like how the game would give you a warning if you try to travel while diseased uh this gives you a warning if you try to sleep while diseased um yeah let's see skullduggery is a crucial mod if you want to be a thief and have a satisf satisfying uh, experience um besides that the pen with papers is also really conducive to thief style gameplay but I honestly i have most of pen with papers disabled it does a lot of things uh i'm just in the settings right now i'll show you a few of them Things like herbalism trapping, the locking, lock picking mini game, and all the dirty tricks. I just um, I couldn't keep up with all of it to be honest, and um, I was always chalking doors inadvertently. Um, the boot is a pretty funny idea though. Uh, anyway, I'm here for the uh, let's see, items edition. Where is the items edition? Loot edition. Oh, add items is what I'm looking for. I really need the Potion of Seeking and the Hook and Rope. That stuff is really cool. I don't use the Landmark Journal. It could be cool. But the Potion of Seeking just makes the dungeon experience really, really cool. Hook and Rope is a neat um, thing to have if you're a thief. Um, let's go back. Uh, lootable Villagers. That's good. Like You get to kill people and take their stuff. Hammer is another legend in our community. Um, this one for me is called uh, Torch Taker, made by yet another legend named Ralzar. Uh, don't install Torch Taker, it's outdated. Go grab Darker Dungeons by Ralsar. Um, it's like Torch Taker, where you can just like grab torches off the wall, but it has many, many other cool gameplay features like being able to collect oil from lanterns. You, um, with Darker Dungeons, all the torches are um, going to be snuffable and candle, uh, candles. You can like um, put the fire out and relight them. And by default, only dungeons with humanoids in them will have the torches lit because if a dungeon has like nothing but rats in it or um, other sort of non-humanoids or undead, like they don't need torches. Why would they be lighting candles and stuff? Um, so it adds a new element of darkness and immersion to have the darker dungeons mod installed. I'd be using it, but the fact that I used Torch Taker created some sort of um, incompatibility whenever I installed the other mod. It's just like a tech issue thing that I don't want to deal with. Um, don't install Torch Taker. Install Darker Dungeons. Uh, let's see. Anything else? Temples Cure Poison is another really good one to have. Um, basically, temples are where you go to get cured of diseases. Now they will also cure you of poison. You just go there and they take care of your ailments. What do you know? Open cages is helpful. Uh, doesn't sound very important, but sometimes you'll get teleported into like it's a very small chance of this happening. But you'll, you can get teleported into a cage, and this will let you get out of the cage. Like you'll interact with it, it'll open up. It's pretty cool. Doesn't happen often, but it's good to have. 
I have unleveled loot and unleveled monsters disabled for now. I want to try it at a later date whenever I've um, already completed the game Iron Man, like in its vanilla version, before I start doing unleveled loot and unleveled. Unleveled loot is understandable, but I don't want to do that without unleveled mobs, which is another mod that, it, like it sounds, um, instead of the enemies being scaled to your level, the um, you just get random enemies that are not completely random, but they can be of any level. Um, it makes it pretty scary because you can find like Daedra Lord at level one. So I'm just going to wait until I've completed the game vanilla Iron Man before I, not vanilla, but you know what I mean, right? All right. Villager Immersion Classic, uh, Classic adds a bunch of, um, cool new textures to the game. Um, uh, you can run into Khajiits and stuff like that. Um, I think there are other mods that do similar things that you should install, um, in tandem to this, but I haven't set them up yet, so I won't go too far into it. Um, an important thing to have in Villager Immersion Classic, regardless of the aesthetics, is um, I think it's this mod that allows guards to help out if there's an enemy in the city. Um, this way, you know, people would do this weird sort of thing that felt like an exploit, where, not an exploit, but it, it's a weird way of doing things. People would summon town guards if they were in a fight in uh, in a city by pickpocketing a villager and then running away instead of getting arrested. And then the guards would fight the thing. You shouldn't have to jump through those hoops. I think Villager Immersion Classic is the one that um, allows guards to just show up on their own because they're guards. Varied Wealthy Homes gives you more stuff to loot whenever you are being a thief in an urban area. Uh, villager Reactions, kind of like Villager Immersion Classics, adds more... Um, life to the city if you start murdering people villagers will run away instead of just sitting there waiting to get murdered um things like winds uh, windmills of daggerfall and uh birds of daggerfall they're nice aesthetic choices but they don't do a ton necessarily um one thing i haven't discussed yet is world of daggerfall i'm not sure if you see it listed on this menu at all uh, but World of Daggerfall just adds a ton of assets uh, all around the world. Uh, here it is, World of Daggerfall and World of Daggerfall Terrain. Um, it just makes the landscape, the cities, and the dungeons have a lot of cool new features to them. Sometimes I'll just be riding across the land, you know, travel option style, and I'll see something in the distance, like a fire, and I'm like, what the hell? There's nothing on my map out there. And I get out there, and there's like a little fortress that wasn't in the base game but was created by these modders um anyway and you'll find like some thieves to fight or to uh loot with uh loot their treasure you know um you'll find shrines in the wilderness you'll find docks um by the bay and all that was just missing in world of daggerfall in the base game it was missing world of daggerfall adds i think a, a level of depth that was probably intended whenever the developers went to make Daggerfall, but you know, um, they were ambitious and limited um, by deadlines and their technology and probably other factors I don't know about. It's a really good one to have, y'all. Get World of Daggerfall, get World of Daggerfall Terrain. Um, another one I should mention is called Warm Ashes. I don't think it's listed here uh, because of the way that quest, uh, the way it works, but it adds a bunch of encounters to the world. Um, you might have seen me click through a couple of dialogue prompts while I was just walking around town. Um, that was usually warm ashes giving me little, um, I wouldn't call them side quests all the times, but things to do um, that can often lead to rewards. Um, warm ashes also adds random um, chances of monster encounters and different kind of NPC encounters while you're traveling. Um, so yeah, that's a really, really good one to have. I think the last one I really want to talk about is, uh, oh, sorry. I need to point out that in order to use darker dungeons, I think you need to have improved interior lighting. I'm not sure if I've pointed out that one yet. Um, this mod, Jewelry Editions, just adds a bunch of cool jewelry to wear and to loot. It's made by Kirk O, who makes a lot of really cool mods, such as Kleptomania. Um, basically, there's a lot of set dressing sort of textures laying around in the game and uh, kleptomania lets you interact with them instead of them just being there of course you'll get caught for stealing if you're not careful but still really good stuff i think kirko also made the limited gold shops which if you've played morrowind this will kind of feel familiar to you but basically each vendor will have a set amount of gold that you can uh, access um 
And so you can't just sell 30 Daedric Katanas in one um, shop and get like, you know, 2 million gold all of a sudden. That dude can't afford that. Um, you can also invest in shops that you think that you'll frequent so that they will have more bargaining power whenever you do bring in loot. It's just, it's fantastic. That's good stuff. Uh, let's see. I should mention that there are a lot of graphical improvements uh, that you can add to the game. For example, um, Dream is a very popular one. Uh, I admittedly prefer the uh, version that you've seen without Dream, but a long time ago, not a long time ago, but for a long time, not long ago, I used Dream textures with um, regular uh, paper doll sprites because I preferred that. But the textures, you know, they, they look pretty good. This is a dream is an oddly controversial topic in the Daggerfall Unity world. Please use whatever you prefer. Um, I have it disabled for um, performance reasons, partially, um, because mods like dream textures, low poly trees, and view distancing, uh, it's called distant landscape, I think, that lets you load more exterior land at one time. Mods like those, um, they just uh, make traveling with basic roads and travel options much harder for my my PC, which was a budget PC whenever I built it, like in 2020. And so I have a lot of graphical options disabled. Low poly trees turns two poly, uh, I mean 2D trees into like um, actual 3D shapes. Really cool stuff. But you know, it doesn't work well. Like I'd rather travel fast over land than have these graphical improvements so I wanted to point out that there are graphical improvements that you can install if that suits you um, it's not my thing for you know I prefer that functionality and I like the old-school graphics yeah in addition to the mods you can install quest packs um, these add new quests to like the random quests that you get from uh, villagers I think they add a few new dungeon I mean uh, faction quests as well um, you can really go search for quest packs and find the ones that you prefer. I believe the ones that are most popular are used by, written by JH, but there are a lot out there. Thank you so much for watching. This video was a bit of a doozy, a little bit ambitious, but hey, we made it through it. I really hope that you have a blast playing Daggerfall. I hope that it grows on you the way it has grown on me. Uh, for more details about ways to make your playthrough really fun and unique, go check out my video about emergent narrative in Daggerfall if you've not done so already. Uh, lastly, I just want to thank people like Interkarma and his uh, successor Cab, as well as all of the uh, mod makers out there that are keeping this wonderful game alive and thriving. Um, can't thank you all enough. I just play this game on repeat basically at this point in my life, and uh, yeah, you helped make that possible. So I really appreciate all the work that you put into this game. Alright, thanks again y'all. Take care.